Mike, good to see you. Good morning, Kyle. How are you? I am good. How are you doing this morning? Beautiful I'm, day, I'm I think it's going to be. A beautiful day. A little muggy right now, but I think that's going to clear out with the wind. I hope so. Yeah. And yeah. we'll finally get into some 70 degree weather here, which is uh, something we haven't seen for a while. <laughs> Very true. And we had a little bit, just a glimpse of it a few weeks ago. We did. Uh, but that kind of, the way it came comes with the, the storm. The storms and the yeah. rain and everything else, but... Uh, yeah, we're finally. I'm, into, I'm ready for spring. I'm ready. Planting is going on. It is. That's my favorite time of season. Yeah, and we're finally getting some nice, nicer weather now. So we're not to wear sweatshirts and jackets and all that crap all the time now. So that that's a. It's finally heading in the right direction. That is correct. I well, agree. hey man, thanks for coming over and and uh, you know giving some background and we're gonna talk uh, concealed carry because you're you're an instructor uh, to to teach that to teach that to uh, anybody that's. Uh, willing and wanting yes so we're going to have a nice conversation about that uh but i want to get into a little background on you if you don't mind because uh you you joined the military i did i was uh raised down in waterman illinois which is south of dekalb about 15 miles farm farmers and uh when i got out of high school i went to college couldn't find my way into a job went in the military joined the military police i was in for six years i served four years overseas I had two years down in Atlanta, Georgia at Forcecom headquarters under General Colin Powell. Um, and uh, so, I, so what did you do overseas then? I was a military police officer in, uh, outside of Frankfurt, Germany, uh, okay. Hanau, a little town called Hanau, about 15 miles out. Um, 300,000 soldiers, I believe, wow. in the area. That's a lot. Several bases that we covered. So it was interesting. We patrolled both on bases and off bases because we have people living off post mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in the foreign countries. So, yeah, it was interesting. It's probably a unique experience to get over there and, and see Germany and parts it, of it, too. It's very unique to live in a foreign country. Um, you get experiences. I, I was talking to my landlord over there at the time, and, and I was talking about our history of American history. And he says, America's born yesterday. You want history? Step out on the street with me. You're standing on bricks that Napoleon walked on. Wow. The church down the street, Napoleon burned. That, I mean, that's, that's history. He said, we're going back 1,600 years right in front of my house. That's just cool. Though. And that really brought a lot of that into perspective when you start looking at the castles. and uh, These things have been around a long time. All the historic yeah. buildings and right. things like that over over there is just mind-blowing. Yeah, and they're everywhere. And, and it's mind-blowing not only because that they're old and historic, but that they're still standing. Right, right. Yeah, it's like they, everything was well-maintained and, and cared for through the generations, uh, whether it be the communities or right. the families that did it. Mm -hmm. I, I believe more communities, uh, personally. It probably is. I don't know for sure, but I think communities help preserve. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's no different than... Like you said, we're, we're pretty young here in America, but uh, even some of the stuff that we have locally and they're still trying to, the community and, and the cities are still trying to keep that up and sure. still trying to keep it looking the way that it was or the way that it should be because it is history for them. So why not? For our that? area, yeah. sure. We have some houses I know right here in Harvard that are over 100 years old that they're trying to keep preserved mm -hmm. to show the way it lived, you know, that the houses looked and were built back then. Yep. And then, like, you know, Glacial Park and things like that, they try to keep all that looking the way that it is because the glacier did go through here, you know? Correct. So it, yeah. it's just when you think about history and, and especially when you get over there, like you said, that's 1,600-year-old history. Right. We've only been around for 250 years. Right. <laughs> and, and you could look and find it farther back than that Correct. without going too hard, you know? Exactly. So when you got out of the military, because um, you, you said you were in for six years, correct? I was. So when you got out, what 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 path or what career did you did you end up taking at that point in time? Well, again, I didn't have a job lined up when I got out of the military. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to work for Farm and Fleet uh, while I was looking for a job just to have some income, uh, support my family, and uh, stumbled upon a, a job with the railroad. A guy talked to me, said, we're hiring veterans. They get preferential treatment. We get right in. And uh, so I, I went down, took the interview. Two weeks later, I was on the railroad. And Perfect. Uh, it's a nice job. It's not the greatest hours. Uh, what, what do you do for the railroad? I'm a locomotive engineer now. Uh, I started off as a brakeman, uh, lowest man on the job, and then I 
promoted to conductor about a year and a half later. Cool. And then about a year and a half after that, I became a locomotive engineer, and I've been doing that for 31 years now. So, so when you're a locomotive engineer, what does that job entitle? The locomotive engineer is the guy that drives the train. He's actually in the control compartment of the locomotive, and he uh, controls the speed of the train and the stopping. So you're the guy. I'm the guy that blows the whistle and rings the bell <laughs> when you wave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What, uh, you said the hours weren't the greatest. What are they like? Are you so on, on the freight side? Um, you're on call 24 7, no holidays, no days off scheduled. Uh, and and back then we didn't have, um, I don't know what they how to phrase it now. It's, um, it's not hours, of, it's an hours of service law where you can only work so many days in a row, and then you have to have if you work so many days in a row, you have to have or so many days hours, off. correct. So we didn't have that back then, and it wasn't uncommon to work 35, 40 days in a row. But in the freight world, when you're through freight service, I would take a train to Milwaukee mm -hmm. and spend the night in a hotel and maybe bring a train back the next day or the day after that. You might be gone two or three days at a time. So that that was kind of your life, and you're home for eight to ten hours, and then they call you, and off you go again. Where, and wherever farther, you're heading. The farther you live from work the less time you have at home. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So now I'm in passenger service. Uh, we sub-lease uh, service to Metra. Um, and and uh, so I'm on a regular job that goes to work Monday through Friday. I have set hours and set days off. Probably a lot nicer that way. Some like it better. Some don't. It's, it's a preferential thing. If you want to be home at night, if you want to make, you know you're going to make X amount of dollars. Freight is kind of hit or miss uh, you have good months that you make a lot a lot of money and they just stuff your pockets and you just can't help it <laughs> and then other months it's really slow and you're a little short you yeah. know it's uh so you have to regulate things differently so you're more con you're more consistent hours and you're more consistent pay hours and pay are more consistent in passenger service yeah so compared that, to freight that, yeah and if you want to stay, see your family, stay at home with your family, you're probably going to be in pasture service. Yeah, yeah. So then you take the train out of Harvard here? Or you, I do. You, I'm, you I'm on a first train out of Harvard, and then I bring the first train back that uh, parks at Harvard in the evening. Gotcha. Then that's all I do. One in and one out. Well, that's not so bad. Sit around downtown Chicago for seven <laughs> hours. That probably isn't that fun. But. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fun in the beginning. You go to all the restaurants and gain weight and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's expensive to do that. Yeah. And and now yeah. to, to go out and eat anywhere downtown, it's twenty five to thirty dollars. Oh, just to go out to yeah. eat, period. It's yeah. expensive now. And then uh so how did you get into um concealed carry? Well, I originally got my concealed carry permit um I don't know, about twelve years ago when it first kind of started. Maybe I waited a year or two. Uh and I carried, and it's intriguing to me. I learned a lot about the laws in that, and, and it always had on my mind that we're uneducated, a lot of us. Uh, and then we think that we understand the laws, and, and even with my police-type background, I was wrong in a lot of ways. So understanding the laws, I think, is important it became more important to me to make sure that people understood people that I'm carrying with understand the laws. So we don't get ourselves in a jackpot and I'm uh, getting closer to retirement. I need a little something to do when I get retire. Uh, and uh, just a side thing, educate people, give them knowledge. And so I decided to get my instructor's permit. I enjoy instructing people. I've been an instructor for the railroad. So it's not unnatural for me to do that. And I enjoy, I get the enjoyment out of uh, being able to give somebody the benefit and the right path uh, for safety and uh, uh, effectiveness, you know. And teaching as well. And, right. and I, yeah, teaching. Information. Sure. How, how do you go about getting your concealed to carry instructor? So the, ins um, it, it's, it's the same as getting your concealed carry permit. Uh, you have to find an instructor class. And they have them every so often uh, in the area. You can look on the USCCA website and uh, and search for an instructor 
CCL instructors class in your area, and it'll just pop up with a list of people that are giving them and how much they charge. Uh, that's a 16-hour class. It's two days, two full days. Uh, there is range time in there, and the class entails pretty much the CCL concealed carry license classroom. Same thing as you get when you get your concealed carry class. Um, but we have interactive instructing. So each student will take a portion of it and learn how to do the presentation, how to stand, how to address the people. It's a basic teaching techniques, talking techniques. Um, really stresses the safety. Absolutely. Because you're, you're now the instructor, and you, if whatever you do, your students are going to also feel is okay. So if you're waving, waving even your toy gun around, uh, which we carry a plastic, uh, for classroom purposes, a plastic replica of a gun to demonstrate handholds and aiming techniques, stance. Safety. So you're stressing the safety that you're not pointing the barrel anywhere because this is one of the things that we preach. Your barrel's only at some, you're only pointed at something that you want to destroy. Yep. So, uh, and it's hard, harder than you think <laughs> to make sure that that barrel doesn't, you do some exaggerated uh, sweeps well, with the... Well, weapon. right, because like you said, you're, you're teaching these folks on, on how to do things the, the safe, the safest way and the correct, the most correct way possible. Correct. So... When you're standing in front of one, two, five, ten different people, you got to make sure that you are doing exactly what you would want them to do. Correct. The entire time yeah. you're doing that. You want to set the example so so that uh, they understand that you're on on that page. You know, you're not just talking the talk, but Correct. Not talking the walk. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and when you do these classes, you do you can do them individually. In a group, uh, how how does all that work? So I register my classes and and I hand out business cards, uh, which we'll show a late one later. But yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll, I'll flop uh, I'll flop. I'm on the USCCA's cards. website, so if you typed up a, a instructor in your area in the Harvard area, my name will come up and it'll show my classes that I have scheduled, and you can sign up for a class through the website. I do f people. I have done individuals at uh, two hours at a time because that's just the way the schedule works out for them, that they don't have eight hours at a time to take or don't want to drive and spend a whole day off uh, because, as we described earlier, we have time off in our break time downtown. So I'll, I'll give two hours at a time to some of these guys, and it might take two weeks to get the whole class in, but we'll go through all the criteria, put in the required 16 hours, and then we arrange for time to meet at a, at a gun range and uh, do our qualification shoot. So, yeah, and I've done groups. I've gone to people's houses and, and done groups of people and the same same thing we did uh, in that particular one. We did two eight-hour classes, uh, one Saturday and then a week. Uh, a week later. Later on the Sunday because that was the way their schedule worked out. I can be flexible. I don't have to do it two days in a row. Um and and I think a lot of instructors are that way. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, that that's nice that you're bringing that uh, that flexibility. Yeah. To, then, to to your students and and, sure. and your customers even. Sure. Because uh, that way, you can appeal to their schedule. What, however, their schedule rides. Maybe they work nights and or maybe they work days. Maybe they work weekends. So you're able to be that flexible. You're gonna have that flexibility to be able to help them all. Sure. Out. That we don't have to sit for sixteen hours in two days and get it all done. You don't have to take time off from your family and. Correct. And now 16 hours, that's if you have uh, no background in like military or anything like that. Because if you do have a background in military and you want to get your concealed carry, it's not a 16-hour class, correct? That is correct. If you have a military background or a police background, you get a uh, eight-hour benefit from the state of Illinois. You only have to have the eight-hour class. It's, uh, it's essentially just the second day of the class. It's mostly Illinois law and some basic uh, things from our criteria is... Uh, gun safety we go through the gun safety thing and but holsters and, and gear and then the illinois state law uh, that's really important as the illinois state law it's very <laughs> that's very important yeah. it's just as important as safety i think it, it is we have a very restrictive law it's it's more of a flea don't engage if you have that opportunity correct uh so i support that 
I don't think you should go hog hog in this uh, situation because, well, I'm carrying a gun. That's not what it's for. No. Uh, the state is really entitling you to a privilege to carry a deadly weapon and that they expect you to act accordingly uh, and responsibly with that, not so you, you shouldn't wear it when you're drinking, for instance. Well, it's illegal too. It, it's illegal in, in most states that carry a gun while you're dr- when you're drinking. Um, so I'd, I, when I know I'm going to be out having cocktails, I either, if I'm, if I'm out shopping already, I have a safe in my vehicle and I lock my gun up in my safe. Or I just don't even take it because I know that if we're going to end up over here having cocktails and, and mm-hmm. it's a zero tolerance if you shot somebody and you had alcohol in your system. If you only had one beer and you say, well, I wasn't intoxicated, the state's attorney may say differently. They may say you were under the influence. Correct. Even though you only had one beer, even though it was 0.01. Agreed. So you don't, you you don't have want to, to put that in there. You have to be responsible for your own You answer. have to be very responsible. And it is, again, a deadly weapon. So Absolutely. that's what it was meant to do. It's, it's no different than driving a vehicle. That right? is correct. Uh, yeah. There's you, responsibilities. Exactly. you got to have the responsibility in driving a vehicle just the same as carrying a firearm. That is correct. I agree. So what are some of the, what are some of the basic things that if somebody was to come in and hire you to get their concealed carry license. What are some of the simple things that you would teach them like day one? Day one, we start off, uh, all classes start off with safety, gun safety. We, we, there's four points to the gun safety, right? So never point your gun at anything you don't intend to destroy. Never put your finger on the trigger until you've decided that that target is the thing you're going to destroy. That's the only time your finger goes on that. And when you pull the trigger, your finger comes off of that again. Uh, Just like at the range, if you're at the gun range uh, and you shoot, when you change, change your stance, you take your finger off the trigger. You don't start moving a gun around with your finger in the trigger. That's how we have accidental discharges. And you don't even realize you did it. Some triggers are a lot more sensitive than others. Some are very touchy. Right. So uh, be aware of what's behind your target. So if you're concealed carrying, you come across a situation and you think you, you're you warranted to, to shoot at somebody, um, what if there's a school bus behind that person that just pulled up? Yeah, you don't really want to shoot. The entrance to Walmart is right there. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad target. You don't want to take that shot. So these are just things you, you that we try to instill in the, in the people that not every situation is perfect. No. Uh, some of the things that I add to it and just my personal thing, uh, just because you're carrying a gun, you're not a police officer. If somebody's robbing a store and they have a gun out, don't be a hero. Let you him can't, rob it. You can't outdraw that guy. He's got his gun out, and you're going to take two seconds to get yours out and, uh, and address him. You know, unless his back is turned and you have an opportunity, maybe you're concealed somewhat and you're able to get your weapon out. Um, but is it worth it at that point? But is it worth it? So, yeah, yeah, you got to make a decision in just a couple of seconds, and the grand jury is going to take months, or state's attorney is going to take months to, to. They will. The other thing I was going to ask you, too, is, is when, when you do these classes, uh, you don't provide a firearm. The, your customers have to have a firearm, correct? I do not uh, provide a firearm. I could. I, I just choose not to. It's a higher liability insurance policy I have to carry for that. Uh, but we go to the gun ranges, and if you're not uh, a gun owner, you can rent a gun at the gun range, uh, and, and I highly recommend it if you're not a gun owner already, to rent several different guns at the gun range. Usually if you rent one gun and, at the range and you get an hour, you shoot it. This is not comfortable to me. You go back to the counter, and the guy will let you have a different gun for the same fee. You know, you might get two or three different weapons that you can try out. Um that was what I was going to bring up is because if, if you don't own a firearm now and you think that you want to own a firearm, these gun ranges will let you rent these specific firearms. So you can see if it fits your hand nice. You can see if it's comfortable when you're holding it. You, you can see if it's, if the grip's too big or too small or it's too heavy, it's too bulky. And maybe you need a lighter, maybe you need a lighter instead of a 45, maybe you go with a nine millimeter, maybe, maybe the nine millimeter is too big. So you want to jump down to a 22, whatever uh, there, there's, there's a lot of different options out there to get 
the feeling that you want when you hold that firearm without having to purchase it at that point in time. Correct. So uh, important to me when my students have uh, firearms, and I don't, everybody's got their own preference on what they carry, what they're, what's Agreed. comfortable with them. I suggest, and I've taken people to gun stores before to, to pick out their carry gun, and, and I get a salesman that's uh, uh, cooperative and patient because we want to handle a lot of different weapons, and we want to be able to sort these out and then say, go back to these and try them again. So if it's not comfortable in your hand, it's not going to be comfortable shooting. And that's, a just, that's just a simple sign of the grip is too big or too small. Yep. And if it's too big or too small, your finger's not going to be in the right place. You're not going to be able to control where the, the bullet goes. So if you're comfortable handling that gun, then when you're shooting it, you're going to have more confidence and you'll be more accurate and, and you'll have more success. Uh, right, and so that's ultimately what we want. We don't want people just putting bullets all over the place. <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're gonna take this, it's a, again, it's a serious thing. You're you're carrying a deadly weapon, and you need to be accurate. Not shoot here, and it goes over there. Correct to your left, uh, and misses the target completely. You want to be at your target if that's necessary, and practice, 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 practice. practice. Uh, and we can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, let's jump into that. So. I, I have a laser system that I use in my basement for me, and I haven't uh, had a student yet to, to play with it, but it identifies a target, and we shoot at the target, practice pulling out of the holster and addressing the target, getting a round off. And when you do that enough, you can do it a little bit faster and a little bit faster, hitting the center of the target. It registers hits and misses. It doesn't cost anything to shoot that laser beam. You can do it in your basement. There is an initial cost. Uh, so a laser gun, uh, like a CERT gun, S-I-R-T, is just shoots a laser. That's all it does. It doesn't come with any software. They're 400 to $500. It's pretty expensive. It's the same price as pretty a, expensive. A, a gun. Yep. But every time you pull the trigger, it's not 50 cents. <laughs> That's the good thing so about it. So you can shoot thousands of rounds in your basement and never shoot a, never lose any more money than that. I'm going to. Okay, go ahead. Two. Your uh, laser, the, bullet. The laser bullet. And uh, it's just a uh, caliber specific. So this one I think is a, a nine millimeter. And it fits in the chamber of the gun, and when the hammer comes down, it hits this little button on the back, and it shites the laser, and that uh, hits the target. So even if you don't have that sophisticated software system and you have just a paper target up on the wall, you can see that you're hitting it because the laser's lighting it up, and it's you don't need the software on top of that. The software's another couple hundred dollars. Yeah, so. but what I was getting at with that is, is that fits that goes right into your actual... Goes right handgun. into the live gun. Yep. 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 So when, when when you so that way when you're holding your gun and you want to practice pulling from the holster and bringing it out and putting it on that target, you can. It's it's still gonna it's, it's not gonna kick obviously, right. but you can still pinch the trigger on your firearm and it's gonna shoot that laser on where it should be. That is correct. And and you're practicing because you're practicing with your live firearm. It's not live in ammo, but it's, it's not live it's in a ammo. Real weapon. Correct. Uh, you're getting the actual trigger pull, your gun, and and all brands of guns and have a break, and the break is where the hammer falls, a little bit different location, and the, the trigger pulls just a little bit different weight. Mm -hmm. But if you're using your own gun, and it let's say it has a three-pound trigger pull, uh, that's what you're getting used to, and you're getting mon muscle memory. So you pull out of the holster, you go to that position, you shoot the target in the center, and you do that 10 times, and pretty soon you don't have to aim, and it's just right there. Your hands just have that feel that everything's at the right angle, the gun is in the right position, and you're hitting the target, and you'll see that you can get faster. But you need to practice that draw from the holster and acquiring the target, get that down. As pat as you can. As pat as you can. Clothing out of the way. You know, you learn how to pull your clothing up and out of the way so you're not grabbing clothes with your gun. You're learning where, where that where that holster and that firearm is on your side, yep. on your back, whatever. So when you do pull it, you don't accidentally, 
use a finger to hit the trigger. That's correct. So all of that practice matters. All that practice matters. And, and that's, I can't stress that enough. Um, there are a lot of people that get their concealed carry and really don't know how to shoot, really don't ever practice pulling their weapon from the holster. And if the situation came, God forbid, that they had to use their weapon, that could be their handicap. Yeah, it could be. Now that now that laser bullet there, you can buy that online, right? These are available easily on Amazon. They're at twenty dollars to thirty dollars, up and down the price range. Yeah, it's a brands. box of shells. Yeah, it's a box of shells that you're going to buy, and you can use that over and over and yep. over. This one happens to come with three sets of batteries, so <laughs> probably shoot it for a year and never cost me anything. <laughs> Just the initial cost to buy it. Yep. Yeah, but that that that's a really cool thing. Whoever invented that was, yeah, was, it was really. A, it's thinking. a great idea, and I think it came from the idea of the uh, uh, chamber lasers for sighting your scopes. You know, they, they, yep. those have been out for quite a while. They have, and I think it's the, just basically just the same thing. I use it to set up my red dot on my pistol. Uh, you pull the trigger, you aim your red dot, and you pull the trigger, and you see it's off. You can make an adjustment until it's oh, that's the red brilliant. Dot and the, laser hit the same exact spot that's brilliant i didn't uh, even think about that yeah that's so you can really sight that in doing that too you can zero it right down for wherever you're at if you set it up at 10 yards it's right there it's right there at 10 yards yep so now when you when you take uh when you take your your students to qualify they obviously have to shoot a firearm and be very accurate with that accurate to a point uh there's a, a required silhouette target that everybody's familiar with. It's the silhouette of a person. It's a 30 uh, by 18, maybe 30 by 20 target. There's a specific target size anyways that the state requires. And uh, you have 10, 10 shots that you have to shoot at 5 yards and then 10 shots at 7 yards, 10 shots at 10 yards. 30 rounds total. You need 21 hits in the silhouette, inside the silhouette, to qualify. Um that's so about pretty, 66% of the time. Yeah, that's pretty lenient. Uh, I would like to see everybody hitting the two center circles. That's not that far. A 10-inch shot pattern should be uh, achievable. But if you're not a, a firearms person, you're just learning, hey, this is acceptable. But again, before we go to the range, I, I take them to the laser, and I take this target on the wall, and we practice sighting the gun because people don't know what sighting the gun means. Uh, so, so we learn, and sighting the gun is just the, if this is the front sight and these are the back sights, it's just the learning how to line that up so that the front and the rear are even side to side, so the front one's center in the middle, and they're level. Up and down. Up and down. And a lot of times they have a white dot on them or a, a orange dots or something on them. Yeah, the back two will have like a white, and the front will have an orange or something, so right. you can really so you see. Can differentiate between mm-hmm. the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, but people don't know how to do that. You know, we go through that in the classroom, and then we use the laser system to teach it. So now you know what we're talking about, and you can apply it. And, and a lot of times when you learn things, it's one thing to hear it. It's a whole different thing to apply it, and yep. then you understand, and, and it, you're more successful. So I've had a few people that were non-shooters. They just didn't grow up with guns and, and ne- never held a gun before the class, and here they are in a concealed carry class and never ha- held a gun. One never even owned a gun. And that person, we took her to the range, and she was able to shoot a 12-inch group, 30 rounds. Good. Inside of 12 inches. So, That's great. Yeah, just a little bit of practice, understanding how it all works, and, and that's, a, all, that's all it takes. Well, yeah, because it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time to get, that, to get that repetition down. Correct. No, no matter if it's... If it's shooting the firearm or pulling it from your your uh, holster, holster, thank you. <laughs> All of that takes practice and time. It, the, the more you do it, the more comfortable you are. The faster you're going to be at it, and the safer you're going to be at it too. Right, more more efficient. It's just like driving your car. When you started driving your car, you were nervous all over the driveway, <laughs> both sides of it hitting curbs. Uh, but with practice, you got better, and pretty soon you felt comfortable going to speed limits stop signs in traffic uh, it's, it's practice. firearm is the same thing firearm is the same it's thing the same thing Do you, are you just uh certified in the state of illinois then i am just certified in the state of illinois um i've thought about maybe getting a utah permit uh, the state of utah required you to 
instructors to take the class in Utah? <laughs> you have to go to Utah to get certified? So Why is quite, that not shocking? Yeah, I haven't decided quite if that's worth the vacation. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, too, uh, being that I brought this up. I just it clicked in my head. So if you get a concealed carry license in the state of Illinois, that's good for, like, 30 states or something, right? Yes. it's it's. Uh, there's a reciprocation law that um, it's a reciprocity. I can't even say it. <laughs> uh, reciprocal law that you can carry in other states. And I want to. Yeah, this is off, not a fact thing. I'm not off, holding off anything. Hand, but... It's like 37 states uh, that okay. allow Illinois concealed carry permit. Illinois does not allow any other states to carry in, Illinois. in the state. That being said, there is a caveat. So if you're driving from Indiana to Iowa, you could drive across our state and not stop for gas. As long as you don't stop, right? And you have a you're you're qualified to carry in your state, you can drive through Illinois. But if you drive into Illinois and stop at the truck stop for lunch and gas, Illinois law says you have to, at that point, store your weapon in the trunk, in a box, uh, empty the magazine out of it. Yeah, yeah. Be be, be the uh, transfer of firearm without having to conceal the carry at that point. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, I did not know that. So like Wisconsin to Kentucky, you're, you're not going to make it. Not going to make it. <laughs> Just not going to make it. I can't, I can't go that far without stopping for a bathroom break. My car won't make it that far without stopping for gas. Oh. Good tune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the only way you get around that is if you go from Wisconsin and you go around Chicago and Indiana and Indiana into Indiana and then go south, you'd probably be all right. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you're going to drive straight through Illinois, yeah, I think it's eight hours from the border here down to the border there or something. Yep. It's down stupid. to Paducah. Yeah. So those are, yeah, just a little caveats. And in in the Illinois law... They, as far as I know, they've never allowed anyone outside the state to get a concealed carry permit in the state of Illinois. It, the law says that there is a possibility that you could. If you come from a state that has a similar system to ours, like they have a FOID card and background check, and, um, and I want to say Virginia is one of those. Okay. There's like three states that have Yeah, that. I think there's only three states that have FOID cards, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And and so if you follow that system, but I don't think anybody ever has. So if if somebody from Ohio decided, hey, I got a job, I need to move to Illinois, and I I have my concealed to carry now, that will not hold up. They got to take another concealed to carry class in Illinois. That is correct. In order to be to, legal in Illinois. Yep. Imagine then, that. <laughs> well, it's, it's CDL is the same thing. Right. Yeah, if if you have a CDL state, in another state and you move to Illinois, you have to re take your CDL in Illinois, right? Which is stupid, but yeah. Um, so a lot of states are changing to constitutional carry states, where you don't need permits, you don't need any training, you just you have the right to carry concealed or open. Um, I, mean, I want to say that's up to seventeen states now. Wow. Uh, there are three recently in the last year. I think Tennessee's one of them. I believe so, too. Uh, what we've seen, if you watch the statistics of states that do that, uh, when Florida did it, uh, the crime, person-on-person -person violent crimes dropped dramatically. I can believe that. So if you don't know that the guy in front of you that you're thinking of robbing and might be carrying, it, it changes it. <laughs> The the fear factor, the right? Fear factor. The, uh, the fear factor of, I'm going to go in and rob this bank, but I don't know who's got a weapon in there or not. Right. And unless it's unless they're open carrying, and right. that's the only way you're going to know. But if they're concealed carry, you don't have a clue. You might go in there and try to rob it and think, hey, there's nobody in here that's got one. And all of a sudden, you turn around and there's three guys. There's three guys or three <laughs> women standing there going, "What are you doing?" Yeah, this was not a good idea. <laughs> you picked uh, the wrong day, bud. So specifically in Texas, that would that would absolutely happen. Um, oh, absolutely! It yeah. happens quite often down there. That wouldn't shock me. 
And I wouldn't recommend open carrying. No. And you just kind of make yourself a target, I believe. It's like wearing a brand name shirt, a gun brand name shirt, and carrying. Is that really smart? If they don't know you're carrying. Well, I, I, I don't know. You're advertising a gun on your shirt. Yeah. And I won't name any names of what gun manufacturers or anything like that because it just doesn't matter. It don't. <clears throat> I, I think you're advertising that I'm probably going to carry a gun. And, and are you a target to take that gun? Exactly. So. Exactly. Um, if you are, you brought a bag with you here today. I did. Uh, what is that bag? What's it consist of? What do you so, got in there? This is what they call a range bag. And, and it's, uh, I'll bring that up. I'll I don't know, about two feet too. wide. And it carries all your essentials you go to the range with. I can put ammo in there. I can easily carry 500 rounds of ammunition in there. Several guns. Pistols. I have a first aid kit in there. One of the things you need to know when you go to the range is things happen. And if somebody gets injured, which uh, we've had happen before, a student uh, holding his weapon improperly, and when the slide came back, it cut his thumb. He's bleeding profusely. Band-aids. It's just a simple Band-aid. He wasn't injured badly, thankfully. Well, then that's the the other thing, too, about these, uh, especially these handguns, is that slide is right there. It's right there. It's right yeah. there. So if you're not holding that thing properly and you pinch that trigger one time, if that slide comes back, it can cut you. Yep. It was his first round. <laughs> <laughs> Poor and I was guy. standing on the wrong side, so I didn't see that. Uh, then I changed, and we went over the, how to hold the weapon again properly. And he, he was successful after that. Uh, so other things I carry in here is uh, ear, my hearing protection. I have uh, electronic hearing protection. I have a marker in here because I'm an instructor. I have to mark, I mark the shots so we can count them all off to make sure you hit the proper amount. I have uh, safety glasses. When you go to the gun range, all gun ranges require hearing protection, whether it's foam hearing protection or earmuffs, and safety glasses. You have to wear some kind of glasses, not particularly safety glasses if you're prescription wear. That's fine too. I carry extra holsters in here. Uh, for demonstration purposes, uh, any gear I may need while I'm at the range. You have it there. I have it right there with me. And Hopefully. I take it to classes. I just stuff extra stuff in there, like uh, multiple holsters. Do you have a favorite holster? I do. Oh, uh, I could get it out. Yeah, like. grab it. Just because uh, th- there's so many different ones out there. Uh, there's so many different brands and, and so many different kinds and and. I didn't know if you had a, a one that you like specifically uh, f- for the firearm that you carry or if there's one that uh, you think is just better quality over the rest of them, more comfortable than the rest of them. Well, let me start with these then. This is yeah. one of the first holsters I bought. It's uh, got a neoprene backing, a leatherish front to it. It holds my compact 45. Okay. It's, it's a inside waistband holster, IWC they call them. Uh, and these clips, these are plastic, and they go over your belt loop. It's inside. It's very comfortable. The neoprene does, if it's hot outside, make you sweat a little bit. <laughs> uh, but it's, the gun doesn't dig into you because of this. Because of the flap there? Yep. It's a nice holster. It works fine for that weapon. I don't carry it very often. I don't carry this holster very often. I changed to a different brand. This is all leather, front and back. It's back leather. It's a heavy leather. It's very durable. Same, they're Kydex. This plastic is called a Kydex, so the weapon snaps into place, and that's what holds it. That's a safety on it. Uh, but the clips are metal. This is not going to break. It holds onto your belt very well. These are plastic. Eventually, these are going to break over time. So I changed to this mostly because it's a metal. A metal, a metal clip. Clip to hold that holds onto your your belt band there. This is an inside waistband. Typically, it goes on your backside or or to the side behind your hip bone. This is an inside waistband holster. has one clip instead of two. This would be more for an appendix. In the front. In the front, right? I hang out a little bit, so it's kind of uncomfortable. In the front. <laughs> I end up using it in the back. Um, and then this one, I don't... It's okay if you go to a range with them. If you're just taking it to the range, it's a universal holster. This one happens to be an inside waistband holster. It does have metal clips. 
Um, I haven't found a semi-automatic handgun that doesn't snap into this yet. <laughs> Every single one of mine does. That's what they advertise. Because of this, I don't think the if you have a rectal, a reticle, a red dot on the front of your top of your gun, it's not going to sit in here. Ah, uh, gotcha. I haven't really tried my red dot in here. They're full size guns and they're five inch barrels. They don't. They're not very comfortable. They're not carry really good anyway. in concealed carry. Yeah. Anyway, so, but if I was going to the range and just wanted something to, to hold the gun because you're at an outdoor range or something with no tables, these work just fine. They're cheap. They're like fifteen dollars a piece. Is there a specific website that you can go on to, like if somebody's concealing for the first time and they want to get something nice and comfortable, is there a brand or is there a website that you like to go to when you're looking at all these things? Sure. The, the, my, those two favorites of mine with the leather backing and the metal clips, those are from Vetter, V-E-D-D-E-R. And uh, I, I think they're a reputable, reputable company. The holsters run anywhere from 60 to $90, let's say. So not cheap, but on the other hand, uh, if if you're gonna if you're gonna carry all the time, you want something that's gonna be comfortable, and you want something that's gonna last. Comfortable and it'll last. You shouldn't buy another one of them in twenty years. Yeah, and then as important as that is a belt. I I brought two different kinds of belts with me. Uh, this is a leather belt. It's for carrying. It's a, as you'll see how thick it is. It's a double. Yeah, that thing is thick. Double back. It doesn't bend too much. It's still comfortable. Um. For a lighter, compact pistol, that's a great belt. This is the newer style carry belts. Uh, they call it divers. I don't know what this is, like fire hose material. Oh, okay. It's, it's stiff. It, do, it doesn't bend. You can hardly crush this. Uh, but it'll hold up a lot of weight. So if you're carrying a full-size pistol, it's not going to bend. It'll never deform. It has a ratcheting system for the... Nice. Grip and then a quick release to let it out. You can carry this, wear this inside your belt loops or just around your waist. When you go to the range, just slap this bad boy on with your holster on it. And you can put that in. Yeah, it doesn't even need to go around your your jeans or anything like no, that. You, you can, just wrap it you can strap that around. Yeah, yeah. They're right on top of your clothes if you wanted to. Um, yeah, so that's just a couple of different things, yeah. what uh, What's your favorite firearm? I have a couple. I've uh, grown. I have a, a six hour 320 full size uh, DH3. It's a really nice uh, handling weapon. It doesn't have any safeties on it. It has a three pound trigger pull. So it it's um, you use a little bit extra care when you when you're carrying <laughs> that. But if 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 you're using your fundamentals, as we talked about, don't put your finger on the trigger. It's not going to go off. No. It will not go off without that. So guns just don't go off on their own. They Something don't. manipulates the trigger to make them go off. Exactly. Every single time, no matter whether you think you did or didn't. The the, the funny thing about a firearm is uh, it's it's a paperweight if you put it right here on the counter. Yep. And it's deadly if you put it in the hands. That is correct. So it's all in it's all in how you handled it, whether or not it was dangerous gun. Um, and and my other favorite gun is a canic a c-a-n-i-k and they're made in uh, turkey okay turkish military turkish police carry them it's got one of the best triggers on the market it has the trigger safety so it looks like it's a double trigger mm -hmm. but you can't pull the big part of the trigger back without depressing the front part of it so if you brush against it it won't go off but that's the only safety on that weapon also very nice gun they handle nice they shoot really well they're very affordable the Canic is half the price of the Sig Sauer. Yeah. Uh, well, so Sig, Sigs are they're a nice weapon for a reason. There's a nice weapon for a reason. And I have a, a CZ. Uh, mine's a P07. And uh, what I like about that is it's a double action, single action. Mm -hmm. a double action being when you pull the trigger, it starts right away. The pressure, it's a higher pressure, like 10 pounds. And that's cocking the hammer back. And then after the first round goes off, the slide goes back and forth, and that cocks the hammer for you, so now you're back into single action. But you carry it just like that. There's no other safety to that. Uh, it has a decocker, so the hammer's not hanging back all the time. Correct. You decock it so it goes into the double action mode. But you carry around in the chamber, and you don't have to worry about it going off. It's a deliberate act to pull a 10-pound trigger. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not one of those you go, oops. It gives you time to think. Um, 
couple of trains of thought on that is if, if you had that 10 pound trigger pull in your first round, chances are in a hurry, you're going to air that round. So that's a good warning shot with practice. You don't, have I don't believe in that. warning shots. They're illegal. <laughs> Uh, for starters, uh, that would be brandishing a weapon federal, and you can go to jail for that. So, yeah. Um, it's important to know all practice, the laws and practice. And practice. practice. Uh, yeah. So let, let's talk about, since I said brandishing, uh, brandishing your concealed carry. So your job is to keep that weapon concealed at all times, including in your car. Just because you get in your car, it's uncomfortable in your back or on your side. You can't set it in the cup holder because that's not concealed. If a person walks by your car and sees a gun in the cup holder, you just... You're responsible. You're responsible, and that's a felony. And it's a violation of Illinois state law, and you're going to get all sorts of problems if it's a cop. So it has to be concealed while it's in your car also. Um, that being said, if you're at Walmart and you got to get something off the bottom shelf, you bend over and your holster comes uncovered from your shirt pulled up a little bit, that's indiscretionary you didn't intend to do that right so if you're trying to change somebody's mind by showing them you have a gun that's illegal correct but if you accidentally show your gun pull your shirt back down continue on your day that's not that's well because you didn't mean to do it an incidental issue right right because if you meant to do it then you're showing it then you're showing it yep you never never show your gun unless you're intending to use it Mm -hmm. that's my opinion uh, I agree with that. Not necessarily USCCA's opinion, but shit does happen too. I mean, we're all human for a reason. <laughs> so my reasoning be behind it is if you drew your weapon and are telling somebody to stop and you have your weapon pointed down at the ground in the ready position, you're just lost a second that may have been the thing that kept you alive unless you brought it all the way up and you're ready and he's still not listening, that was your warning, bam. But now you've got it into a position where you're actually even aiming because you've practiced and you're going to deter the threat, right? When yeah, the gun goes off, you're probably going to hit him. Because the only time that you're supposed to draw your weapon is if you're going to fire your weapon. Correct. And the only way that you do that is if you are 100 percent in fear for your life or your family's life or or somebody else's life yeah, that, so that is that's absolutely correct and another problem with that caveats is again something more to think about so i walk up on uh, two guys outside in front of a bar fighting the guy on top is just beating the living heck out of the guy on the bottom and i shoot the guy on top because he's definitely going to hurt him but i just shot the guy that was the victim I didn't get there for the beginning of the fight to see what happened. The other guy beat this guy in the back of the head with a chair <laughs> and then lost the fight. Exactly. Uh, but I didn't see that part, and I jumped to a conclusion. So if, you don't, if you're not there and don't know who the victim is... Keep that baby holster. Keep it, a, keep it in the holster. Don't get involved to that point. Call the police. Help break it up. Whatever you need to do, but don't... Uh, put yourself in a position where you're just going to go to jail for the next 30 years because you picked the wrong person. Because you made a mistake. Yeah, that's not a mistake you want to make. No. Taking a taking a life is not. It's, it's not, not something be an easy thing to start with. I, I, I don't wish it on anyone. No. no. Uh, the only like I said the, to me, if you're going to conceal to carry, in my opinion, the only time you draw that weapon is when you're going to shoot it and you are in fear for your life or your family's life. I'm sorry if somebody else is getting the shit beat out of them outside of a bar, you probably had it coming. <laughs> Good one way or another possibility so kyle's not going to stick my neck out right and, and that's neither, not happening neither am i so but you can be a good witness correct you can be a good witness i don't disagree with any of that you know that sucks for that guy that's getting the crap beat out of him but on the other hand it's like i mean you can try to break it up i'm not saying yeah. no, don't try to break it up but just don't you, you shouldn't be shooting him until you know who the victim is correct so you know if somebody's stealing your car you let them no, steal it it's that's replaceable uh, under illinois law you have to it's <laughs> Yeah. So th- these are all things we go over, but like I say, the second day is mostly Illinois law, and there's a lot of it. There's a things lot. Things you can of it. and can't do. Uh, funny, in the Illinois state law, your domicile, your castle, is pretty much where you lay your head. So if I'm sleeping in a tent in the backyard, that's my castle. <laughs> and I can defend inside my castle, but I can't defend outside my castle, right? 
Got it. So I can't I can't uh, defend somebody that broke into the house to steal a TV. You just can't shoot that person because he broke in the house. Your life has to be in danger still. Right? You have to feel imminent threat to your life or, or imminent danger that you could be great bodily harm. Um, so you have to have a plan for even in your home. You when, do. You, when you have a gun for home protection, you can't just shoot somebody because they walk through the front door. Unfortunately, they can uh, under Illinois law. Different in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, because I uh, when I went through the concealed to carry course, uh, it was one of those. They said, "Yeah, you know, if if you wake up in the middle of the night and a guy's running out your front door and you shoot them, you're wrong. You're gonna go to jail. You're yeah. wrong." And I'm like, I mean, I, I get it, but I don't. You sure. know, what I, it's like, yeah, you, he's fleeing because he or she's fleeing because they've seen you, so they're fleeing the scene. But on the other hand, I don't know if that guy's got a gun or doesn't have a gun or threatening my, maybe he's got a sword. I don't know. You know right. what I mean? Right. You don't know that until you stick your head around the corner. By that time, it could be too late. Right. That's, that's true. And if you hear somebody rattling around in your garage, stealing your car, you can't shoot them. It's not inside your house. You weren't in danger. And recently we had a shooting in Chicago in a jewelry store. Guy was coming in and trying to rob the jewelry store, and he was breaking a glass and stealing stuff. And uh, we had a concealed carry guy that happened to be working in the store, and he shot this guy. He got in trouble. The concealed carry guy got in trouble because nobody's life was in danger. Yeah, that's that's wrong. The robber. Nobody's trying to press charges on him. Apparently, I haven't heard of any. I I didn't. But even I do hear know the concealed it, carry guys. Uh, uh, he's uh, under shit. charges. For, for <sighs> illegally firing his uh, weapon. You know, if I lived in a state like Texas or Tennessee, something like that, I would probably have my concealed to carry. I told you, I just I just said that I went through the class, and when I got all said and done with the class, I thought to myself, do I want to have all of this liability on me to make the right, to make a split second decision, whether it's right or wrong? Yep. And then it could affect my life forever. Yep. Or do I take my chances and go, you know, I live out here in the middle of nowhere. I don't travel to the city very often. I don't travel to big cities very often. Maybe it's just better if I keep the firearms in my house to protect my property, protect myself, and then take my chances out in the public. Now, that's my opinion. And that's so I, I ended up not getting a concealed carry for that reason. For that, for that exact reason. Because yep, it's like... There's a lot of liability on you to make the right decisions. And it's that fast. And so it helps to be knowledgeable about the law. Watch. I like to watch the cases that happen, uh, the things that happen, the cases, and see how they progressed as far as I can follow them without getting into court documents and things. But the news yeah. reports a lot of that stuff. And find out where it went from there and, and, and keep that in your mind, right? So the lesson in the jewelry store and, and uh, River, on Jewelers Row in Chicago was nobody was being harmed or threatened. You can't just shoot that guy. Should he be able to protect his business? Absolutely, I agree. He should be able to protect his business. But these are the reasons a lot of people don't carry. This is the reason I stopped carrying. When I first got my concealed carry license, I said, oh, geez, there's so much liability on you. Why would you want to carry a gun? Exactly. Um no, I know people out there that do have it, and they do carry. And hey, I, my hats off to you. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not against it at all. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do carry a lot more now, uh, but my my concern pattern now is not so much a robbery in a store. I'm going to let them rob the store, mm -hmm. give them whatever they want, even if it's out of my own pocket. I give them all the money they want. I don't need to shoot this guy. He's just robbing a store. But I worry about car. Road rage. Uh, that that seems to be a, a growing issue and problem. Uh, and, and simply, if somebody gets out of their car and a chase after you, you can just drive away. But if you're in a car accident or something, and, and that guy thinks you're the guy that caused the problem, and he comes out and chases after you, and your car is disabled, now now you have a problem. Yep. Right. And you need to stop that guy in his tracks. Uh, and usually, a gun will do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just just 
get it out and and show them that you're here. Point it at them. Stop right there. I have a gun. If you continue on this path, you know, I'm in fear for my life. Shot. I'm in fear for my life. So, so go back to your car and wait for the police. What are some, since we're on this subject, what are some things that, uh, that are not a benefit to being a kid? I mean, obviously we went over a few here with the, with the jewelers and the robbers and, and, uh, and the car accident scenario. What are some other reasons why having concealed a carry could be not always a great thing in your opinion? Well, it kind of restricts uh, a lot of the places you could go in a normal day. Uh, you happen to be out driving and your your one of your kids wants to stop and play in a park. Well, under Illinois law, you can't go in a park with your gun. Um, you can on bicycle trails, so certain trails in the state of Illinois, but some are not. It's hard to keep track of all that stuff. Uh, you go to a block party, like Naperville has a big block party. You can't carry at the block party. It's a public gathering so that's illegal under, under the state of Illinois' law. The Highland Park shooting, nobody could carry because it's a parade going on downtown. I think the situation would have changed had that not been the case. Agreed. I, I think there were, in, in the, the thousands of people that were there, there would have been 20, 10 that had a gun and would have started shooting back right away, ex-military people like myself that that's not acceptable to start shooting at me, and I'm not going to defend myself. I would have started shooting back, and then somebody would have went around the backside of the building and found a way to get up top and stop it. Yeah. But that's the way we think. That's the way we were trained. Um, how many – you got some statistics there, uh, and I think that's about how many uh, firearm owners, correct? Uh, f- Foid card holders. Foid card holders. There you go. Uh, versus concealed carry licenses. In the state of Illinois, uh, the most recent records that I've found, uh, the concealed carry licenses, there's roughly 450,000. In the state of, of Illinois. In the state of Illinois as of this year, uh, 2023, I believe that statistic was. Uh, the FOID card carriers, there's over 2.4 million. That just means you have the ability to buy firearms and or ammunition. Not necessarily that you, that you did. Yeah, correct. Um. In 2014, the CCL license was pretty new. Uh, we had 90,301 uh, concealed carry licenses. And then in 2020, there was 343,000. Oh, so it's went up. And then 2024, up to date, we were over 450,000 concealed carry licenses in Illinois. So people are, people are, are, are getting them. At, a, at an exponential rate now, uh, as, as the climate, whatever climate you want to call it, I don't want to call it a political climate, but the crime seems to be growing. And as the crime seems to grow, people feel a need to... Uh, to uh, protect themselves. Protect themselves Absolutely. and their families, and they're, they're starting to get more concealed carry licenses. So That's a really interesting statistic. Yep. Yep. 450,000. Concealed carry holders in the right. state of Illinois. There's uh, 12.5, over 12.5 million residents in the state of Illinois. Now, that's including children, I, I believe. It didn't break it down that way. So Yeah, I mean, I would imagine it's everybody. everybody. It's a pretty small portion of, of people that own guns and have concealed carry. Um, I, I believe there's probably a lot of people out there that don't have a concealed carry permit that do carry. <laughs> Which is illegal and wrong. It's illegal and wrong. And it, <laughs> it, 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 that will carry a high high price. Yeah, it will if you get caught. If you get caught. So, yeah. Well, man, this has been really informative. Thank you for uh, taking time to come over and, and talk firearms and concealed yeah. carry. And yeah, anything my, else you want to add? My pleasure. Oh, uh, no, I, uh, I'm a defense solutions dot, at yahoo.com. Yeah, I'll, pu- I'll put your card back up there yep. again. And the uh, best way to contact me is through that uh, email or on the USCCA website. You could uh, I have my phone numbers on there. If you go through that website, you could sign up for a class. Now, do you do, you do classes anywhere, or do you have specific places that you do them? Or? I can do the class anywhere. I can come to your home and do it. I, if, if you can get a couple of friends together, it helps motivate me. <laughs> <laughs> if we do three or four people, it's a lot better class than just one person. Makes sense. 
Uh, you get questions and answers. So you get more thorough, I think, a more thorough understanding. Uh, I will do them in my house, in my own home. And uh, I shoot in the uh, range we go to as a Marengo D5 or uh, it used to be on Target in Crystal Lake. It's now North Shore Sports and uh, Second Amendment up in McHenry. So I travel the area. I have done classes in McHenry and Rockford, Belvedere. Perfect. Harvard. That way you can... Uh you're pretty flexible to be anywhere then. I'm pretty flexible to be anywhere, and I can work with your schedule. Again, if it's Saturday, Sunday doesn't work, uh, just send me a, send me an email. Say, hey, I'd like to do this, but uh, I can only work on do it on a Saturday and maybe only four hours at a time. We can break it up. It doesn't have to be done this week. It can go over a month, you know, if it's four hours at a time. Perfect. Uh, yeah, perfect. Well, I'll, like I said, I'll put that card up there. They can look at that and, and get, a hold of you, get a hold of you if anybody's got any questions. But... Again, Mike, thanks for coming and doing this and, and hopefully bringing a little uh, knowledge to uh, not only firearms but the concealed carry community. And, uh, yeah, stay safe out there. Well, thank you for having me, Kyle. It's been a pleasure to see you. And it's see always a house. pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. We'll see you later. Take care.